All right, here we go. So under fueling, uh, LEA and REDS, we're just gonna briefly cover that, go over uh, the long-term health consequences. And I have this broken down into kind of different bodily systems. So heart health, bone density, mental health, sexual function, gut health, and then some practical tips so that you can diagnose, but also kind of next steps, how to use fuelin effectively to help avoid this. And then obviously leave some questions, some time at the end for Q and A. All right, so to review, I think that this is helpful uh, just to highlight the difference. So LEA, and I know that you guys have heard us talk about this, this is low energy availability versus REDS, which is relative energy deficiency in sport. So LEA, uh, basically low energy availability is when your body does not have the um, energy coming in in order to maintain daily bodily functions, maintain the work that you're doing, uh, the underlying causes, either from um, what we call the athlete triad, the female athlete triad, and REDS. So this LEA is a broader term that encompasses relative energy deficiency in sport. It can either be intentional or unintentional. If you're looking at just the, which Scott and Alan and I have talked, it's, it's hard to define because there are a lot of components that go into daily energy. But if you're looking at it just from a caloric input, uh, females that are lower than 30 cows per kilogram of fat-free mass, males that are lower than about 15 uh, calories per kilogram of fat-free mass, Low energy availability can either be intentional or unintentional. And the intentional component is where we see some of that disordered eating coming in, whether that's dieting, whether that's a full-blown eating disorder. And the unintentional, uh, which as we've seen a lot with fuel and athletes think they are eating enough or they believe that their energy needs are lower than they actually are. And so then the end result is they end up with low energy availability because they didn't, they weren't taking in what they thought they were taking in or they didn't think they needed as much as they did. Uh, and then the question becomes intake versus expenditure. How much are you taking in versus how much you're expending on a daily basis? So REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport, that is, again, it can be underpinned with low energy availability, uh, negatively impacting health and performance, both males and females are at risk. And this is really a takeaway point that I want to make sure that we leave today with is that this is not just a female issue. It is not just a young female issue. It is both men and women of all ages. Uh, most uh, we're speaking about endurance sports, but you see it in, uh, uh, gosh, weightlifting, competitive bodybuilding, you see it in wrestling, um, you know, uh, all different kinds of sports, obviously, um, today focusing on, on endurance sports. So from the perspective of what does low energy availability and REDS, what energy systems and what, when you're looking at uh, your body, what are you going to see? So you see that decreased power, decreased um, ability to train, decreased training response, decreased recovery. You are seeing uh, lower motivation to train, decreased muscular strength, performance, so if you have been going about your regular training and you start to see these decreases, these are some of the kind of signs before you get, before you actually start seeing these longer term health issues that we're going to speak about. I, we just posted a reel this morning on fuel and really diving into some of these symptoms. So if you are <laughs> frequently getting sick, frequently getting injured, uh, have injuries that aren't healing. Usually these are stress fractures or bone injuries. If as a female, if you lose your cycle, 
if as a male you're having uh, erectile dysfunction or sexual problems, those can also be signs that your hormones are off. If you have a decreased motivation to train or even a decreased motivation to participate in life. So if you notice that the things that you used to enjoy doing before you aren't particularly enjoying. Now, if you're feeling signs of depression, uh, if you're having brain fog, if you were, if you have a significant either increase in like rapid weight loss, or if your body, if you're no longer able to maintain or build lean muscle mass, all signs, all warning signs that potentially you are under fueling again, intentionally or unintentionally. All right. So when we're looking specifically at bone density, so as athletes, it's very easy to get caught up in either looking a certain way for performance, uh, judging ourselves very harshly, wanting to uh, falsely assuming that leaner is faster. And so during these periods of time that we are potentially under fueling, the long-term implications are things that we are not thinking about in the moment in, you know, in the season it's, Oh, I want to be faster. I want to be stronger. I want my body to look a certain way, but today I'm really going to be looking at and trying to highlight the importance of what happens years, months, years, and then maybe even decades down the line. If you aren't properly taking care of your body. So bone density is one that we discuss a lot. And I think a lot of people are familiar with, but it very much is a serious issue that if you are under fueling for as much as three to six months, that can already start to impact bone density. And as I have listed here, zero to 25 years old, that's when you are doing bone formation and you are getting all of the kind of bone density, bone mineral density that you're going to get from 25 to about 50 is when you're able to maintain that bone density. And, and hopefully if you're eating well and doing strength training, and then at 50 years and above, basically, that's when stages of bone density start to decrease. And so if during zero to 25, which a lot of young athletes that aren't fueling properly and have disordered eating, they're in a danger of never fully allowing their body to get as much bone density as possible. And then if it's during years 25 to 50, then you're potentially degrading that bone density, losing bone density at a faster rate, which leads to early signs of osteopenia, osteoporosis. And so while not being able to not only perform and do what you want, you're actually increasing the chance later in life that you will have serious bone injuries and osteoporosis. So what we know when our body is not fueled properly, that throws our hormonal system off. And when our bodies aren't producing the hormones that they need to function properly, that impacts bone turnover and bone remodeling low energy availability also increases that bone breakdown. So you see a faster degra degradation of that bone mineral density. So it's not even that you're not making and turning over the bone and bone remodeling, it's that it's actually degrading at a faster rate when you're not fueling yourself properly. Um, I, so ideal body weight is one of those, like if you, do, if you don't go get a DEXA, which we recommend if it's, financially feasible and um, you're able to do that, that's the best way. But if you have an ideal body weight, that can help be a predictor of low bone mineral density. So if you're wildly underweight for what your height, um, the height and weight chart says, that could be a potential sign. And then at that point, very we very much encourage going and getting a DEXA scan. Uh, and then during a single year, I thought this was a very interesting statistic, three to 36% of endurance athletes, and I would guess this is actually quite higher, will suffer at least one stress injury, whether that's a stress fracture, a muscular injury, um, an actual bone breakage, 
much more common than we think. And that low energy availability, low bone density uh, issues is where we're starting to see those. All right, when it comes to sexual health. So menstrual irregularity or an absence of the menstrual cycle. The medical terminology is called FHA, which is functional hypothalamic amenorrhea. <clears throat> As I said before, when your body isn't getting the fuel that it needs, hormone production drops. And that's when the body is basically maintaining vital functions and it doesn't count hormonal health, uh, getting a menstrual cycle, um, having sexual health, both male and female, that is not a priority for life. And so those will cease. Fertility, obviously fertility goes down, erectile dysfunction, loss of sexual drive. Uh, a study that we ha I have listed set showed that as little as four days of a low carbohydrate diet intensified uh, the cortisol response and cortisol um, has that kind of cascading effect that will then high cortisol has detrimental actions on other hormones in your body. So a lot of times when athletes are experiencing low energy availability, which we'll talk about a little bit at the end, and it is because they are on some kind of either low carbohydrate, uh, insert whatever diet fad you want here. And the fact, if you're not have, getting enough carbohydrates, that affects cortisol, which then affects hormone production, which then interferes with menstrual health, fertility, erectile dysfunction, sexual drive, those components. So now we've seen bone health um, affected. We've seen sexual health affected. I thought this was a really important uh, kind of picture of hormonal health and showing that when you are on lo having low energy availability. So uh, these are a list of some of the hormones for those that are just listening and not watching. So if you're looking at FSH in men, that goes down immediately. Uh, in women, it slowly degrades. Progesterone, testosterone, all of those go down. Cortisol goes up. TSH, uh, total T3, free T3, total T4, free T4, all of those drop when you're not getting fed properly. Uh, GH, IGF-1, leptin, uh, grenoline, all of those, insulin, all negatively affected. So it's not just one component. It is your entire hormonal health profile that begins to suffer when you're not fueling properly. All right, this is a big one. And this is something that I think is one of the most interesting new, and I want to say new findings in the last several years, is the effect that underfueling has on heart health. And the majority, for, for a change, the majority of the studies that they've done have been in women because what started the, I guess, deeper dive into heart health was they were looking at menopausal women and heart health. And we know that women that start hormone replacement therapy 10 years, uh, up to 10 years before going through menopause, that they have a greater uh, a better chance of not having heart issues, not dying from cardiac arrest. And so they were looking at this hormone panel and they found that estrogen was a big component of that. Insert multiple different studies here. And they then went to look at women that were coming into ERs with heart issues that were between the ages of 18 and 45. And all of the women that were having cardiac arrest, stroke, you know, these are women that otherwise were healthy and should not have been having heart issues. All of them had low estrogen, low progesterone. And so then they dove in deeper and realized that a lot of these women had been either under fueling, chronic dieting. So long story short, or not so short, is the fact that when you, when 
your body isn't producing the estrogen that it needs, you are at a higher risk for heart blockages, stroke, cardiac arrest. And the reason that they found is because they know that estrogen promotes vasodilation, which is basically just the opening up of those blood vessels. So imagine, I think we've all kind of had that, they use the rubber band analogy, the brand new rubber band that is super elastic and stretches and bends and can tighten versus the very old rubber band that when you go to pull on it, that's when it tears or shreds. So estrogen helps keep that rubber band or your blood vessels opening, closing, and very efficient at doing the job that they're supposed to do. So when hormones are suppressed because of underfueling, there isn't estrogen flowing in the body, therefore putting you at a greater risk for heart issues, uh, and then especially cardiac arrest down the line. And they have now started looking at testosterone and they see that men with lower testosterone are at a greater risk of heart disease. So tying that back to low energy availability, if your body isn't making the testosterone that it needs, men, you're also at a greater risk. So the kind of combination here, the formula is if you have high stress hormones mixed with low sex hormones, that's when you have the bad outcomes. That's when the, those are when the problems start to arise. Another area that we see is mental health, underfueling, low energy availability, uh, depression. And we know this because Scott and I have talked about how our brains function and depend on carbohydrates to do their job properly. Long term brain health, where you have serotonin and dopamine, those are all. Uh, when your body isn't being fueled properly, you're not producing those. And we know that both of those are involved in mood and depression. Athletes, especially that are under fueling are at an increased risk of depression. And then if you follow that from years down the line, now, as they are looking at and studying older athletes, they have found that athletes that chronically under fueled are at a greater risk for Alzheimer's disease and dementia, which makes sense because if you're not properly fueling and taking care of your brain, eventually, like the rest of your body, it will not function in the way that it is supposed to. So uh, impor important to be fueling. All right, now gut health. So here's another one. And as I touched on earlier, a lot of athletes that are under fueling are doing it in a way that they're limiting carbohydrates and carbohydrates are a pretty important component of the fuel in program. That's why we have the, the traffic light system. We are a firm, big believer of incorporating carbohydrates, making sure that they're a part of your diet on a daily basis. And, but whilst also being very mindful of when your body needs carbohydrates, when it needs more, when it might need less, when to make sure that you're fueling your body properly, whether that's in session, immediately after. So if you're not just getting the encouragement from us about carbohydrates, and we haven't sent that message home, looking at all of the issues that can arise from low energy availability, there are still athletes that you know don't wanna eat carbohydrates or they wanna be, I'm using air quotes, fat adapted, or, you know, are being very mindful and in athletes with disordered eating, especially lower carbohydrates or no carbohydrates is kind of a common issue. Gut health is very much tied to carbohydrate consumption. Uh, if you're looking at fiber rich carbohydrates, so those found in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, those nourish the beneficial gut bacteria which regulates bowel movements, which reduces inflammation. Athletes and individuals with disordered eating have increased gut permeability, low-grade inflammation, and they're actually finding autoantibodies, meaning uh, antibodies that are fighting against your immune system. And if you're not consuming enough food, you get what's called appetite dysregulation, so the body produces different hormones that affect appetite, leptin, ghrelin, pe uh, peptide, YY, and these different gut bacteria 
will affect how much of these hormones that your body produces, controlling when someone feels hungry, when someone doesn't feel hungry. So you can end up by under fueling, kind of dysregulating your hunger cues and hunger system and therefore throwing off knowing how much food to eat, when to eat, uh, not, and then in turn, increasing gut permeability, which causes issues athletes have suffered from IBS, uh, from, you know, bloating gas, it's looking at a FODMAP diet to try to help some of those. I know we've seen athletes that have, or have looked into like a leaky gut, athletes getting sick a lot. Uh, so, carbohydrates and consuming enough food in general for athletes, for men and women, that's between 25 and 40 to 45 grams of fiber a day, depending. You want to make sure that not only are you providing those fiber rich uh, fruits and vegetables to help with beneficial gut bacteria, but also that you are consuming enough food so that you're having regular bowel movements every day which is something that athletes that don't eat and fuel properly will often be constipated or bloated uh, and not have regular bowel movements. All right, so again, to kind of bring this back full circle, to avoid all of those problems, are you under fueling? And I think obviously at fueling, because because those of you that are using the program, we are potentially taking care of that for you based on your training, based on your input. Are you having frequent bone injuries, prolonged low mood or irritability, prolonged low energy, poor sleep quality, sexual dysfunction, decreased performance, iron deficiency or other vitamin and mineral deficiencies, constantly getting sick, all of these could be signs that you are under fueling. So what to do about it? Understanding your requirements, fueling breaks those down pretty succinctly for you. Uh, if you think that you are not fueling properly or if an another sign, and I speak from experience, uh, that you are under fueling and potentially have disordered eating is if you are constantly thinking about food all the time or constantly thinking about avoiding food, or there are social cues that give you anxiety about food, reach out, talk to teammates, talk to other athletes. You can talk to Scott, Alan, or myself, coaches, uh, mental health professionals. It's definitely something that you want to speak up about sooner rather than later, because the sooner that we can get this fixed, the less likely you are to suffer some of these long-term consequences. And I can also say, speak from experience that the longer that it goes on, the harder it is to actually change that habit and kind of reset your mind on proper fueling and nutrition and hydration in your daily life, but also in your training. Fuel for the work required. Don't skip those in-session fueling. Uh, we very clearly mark in the app what we would like you consuming and that's just a matter of actually planning that out logistically but also checking it checking that box as if it was actual training i think we're all really good as endurance athletes about making sure we get the workouts done fueling is part of that and treating it as if it was another workout session is just as important um and then addressing, as I said, some of the psychological issues. I think the key takeaways here, one of the things that I love about the app, the Fuelin app is that we have you do the daily kind of check-in. And I think this is a handy tool potentially before you start, you know, before your hair starts falling out and you have night sweats and you lose your period. Uh, that well-being score. So when we ask you every day and we say, are you a one, two, three, four, or five? If every day you're a four consistently or you know a five or a three even, and then you have four days, five days, a week, two weeks where you're just a two, you're a one or a two. If that well-being score has dropped and then it's dropped consistently for an extended period of time, 
that's a sign that something's not right. If your mood and well-being, ability to train, ability to sleep, if that starts to drop, that's a signal that something's going on. Get blood labs. This is the perfect time of year. Have your hormones tested. Look and see if your hormones, if you have potentially been under fueling or done damage during the year, that harder training, get a look at what's going on inside your body. Look for vitamin and mineral deficiencies because we want to start treating those. If you're chronically low in vitamin D and calcium, that's going to affect bone mineral density. It's also going to affect brain health and heart health. Um, changing your relationship with food and fueling, eating those carbohydrates, the importance for heart, brain, bone, gut health for mood, all of those components uh, for hormonal health, carbohydrates are essential and making sure that you are getting enough, making sure that you're getting enough food in general, that's what's going to make a difference. And then obviously reaching out. Scott Allen, myself, a certified mental health professional, a coach, a teammate, uh, something to start addressing where some of those issues could be coming from. All right. And stop sharing and open it up for some questions. Let me open this chat up. Let's see. Yes, Adam, I agree. A DEXA it, in most parts of the world is pretty cheap compare, comparing to like an MRI or uh, something like that. So very much worth it because a DEXA will also give you uh, body fat percentages, lean muscle mass, visceral fat. It can do all of that uh, resting metabolic rate. And I like as a female that is worried about bone density, I like getting that DEXA scan done every five to 10 years or so, at least to make sure I have those benchmarks for looking at where my bone mineral density is. Same with blood labs. You make me want to do that because I'm over 50 and I, now I want to know, you know, I've been having energy issues all the last year and a half, which is why I jumped in on this one. And, uh, fueling is already just using the app for the last month. I've already identified that carbs are probably the big, but it's not that I don't like carbs. I love carbs. It's more, and it, I, I, it was either getting way, way low in my fat, you know, not, maybe mm -hmm. getting 40 grams of fat or 35 grams of fat and then going too high in carbs or vice versa. So this is kind of just more balanced me on yeah. a daily basis. Oh, and yeah. I've already, I've already felt the difference. And you know, I, I did a race this past weekend. It was just a 5k, but you know, every race has been giving me like a low afterwards. I did get sick, but I didn't, I didn't get that low mentally. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. Oh, I'm still happy. What is going on? Yeah. <laughs> and, my, and my muscles recovered too. So it's just, I just got sick, but whatever I was, I think yeah. I was sick going into it. So anyway, yeah. just thought I'd no, share that. Thank you for sharing. And I think that that awareness, which is why I touched on the unintentional part of LEA and underfueling, is even with the best of intentions, we either think we're getting enough or we're trying to do that kind of balancing act on our own. And it just helps to have that kind of third third party in remind either reminding you when and how to fuel or yeah. teaching you, as I hope that the app has done for people in kind of how to balance a lot of those different macronutrients and at different times. And to your point, right. you know, I touched a lot on carbohydrates, but fats are very important for hormonal health as well. So making sure that we're getting enough of those uh, equally, equally as important. I also discovered an iron deficiency at the beginning of this year too. So it's all been everything yeah. you've said, I, I feel like I've experienced in the past year and a half. So I had to say something. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad that you did. And yeah, you're, you're not alone. I have experienced all of those things and a lot of athletes have for sure. Uh, let's see. Margaret asks, uh, if the DEXA shows osteoporosis, the side effects of the drugs recommended don't sound good. I am not going to start giving medical advice 
but I have heard that uh, older athletes that are looking to maintain bone density, that some of those drugs are kind of the, the best way to go. I would say from a training and diet standpoint, strength training is important um, in order for at least maintaining the bone density that you do have. But I would definitely, before taking any drug that has potential dangerous side effects, I personally would get a second or a, or a third opinion before taking any of those. But, Thank you. Yeah. Any, let's see, uh, questions maybe potentially around fueling around training or double sessions during the day. Oh, Sandy, thanks. That's great. Sandy said, ever since I've started doing fuel in my training, stats have improved remarkably. Um, oh, but I keep going over on carbs and fat. Well, uh, I would say is uh, body composition still about where you want? I think that would be um, probably a marker if uh, you're overfeeding or underfeeding. Um, hopefully I, I like hearing that things are improving. I'd be curious to see what it, what changed, um, that fuel and did differently maybe than that you were doing before. Scott's put some notes in the chat, uh, for everyone, if you want to take a look. Yeah, I'm just adding in there. I know that was a question about, um, the drugs in for bone density, but I think what the study is that I just put in is actually a study called Lift More, which was an acronym. But what they did was actually reverse osteoporosis through an intervention of heavy strength lifting, uh, heavy weight lifting, sorry. And it was the first time where they've really shown, as far as I'm aware, the first time they've really shown that you can actually change bone mineral density in a significant manner from complete osteoporosis to actually bring it back to a level which was you know regarded as sort of pretty decent but what it was was a very um controlled intervention which had women lifting correctly and again like the whole notion of heavy lifting is relative to whatever you can do and it's percentage of one rep max so if your one rep max is only 20 kilos it's you know probably somewhere like 90 percent of that where you're going to get a positive impact on muscle but also bone but it is a really interesting study that i think more and more people uh should take note of and and that importance of strength training if we're talking particularly about bones and bone mineral density um, and this period of time if you are in the northern hemisphere of q4 and loading your bones appropriately because maybe you don't get it in the um <clears throat> in season period is a really important period of time. So I just uh, want to address a, a question about red S and symptoms and kind of how to handle that. So I can speak personally from experience that uh, it took not only consuming adequate amounts of food in general on a daily basis, carbohydrates and fats specifically, because I was always nailing the protein. That was always easy. Um, but it actually took kind of stepping back from training uh, for a while for me doing, I don't know if uh, this athlete has had a full blood profile, but it took addressing vitamin and mineral deficiencies. It took time off of training which I know nobody wants to hear, but now potentially like it took three months of really, I don't want to say no activity, but it was daily walking uh, before and then really upping the intake of fats and carbohydrates um, before my body personally started, uh, started to get out of that red S and starting to return to normal. Um, and then gut health took probably a year before that got better. So it's kind of a, I would say if you're starting to see improvements and if you're starting to fuel better, then 
uh, that's a step in the right direction. But if you're still experiencing those symptoms, then your body still is, is asking either for more of something or, or less of something potentially in terms of activity. I think that's a really good point is that the long-term consequences of this are going to be so much more profound than dealing with it very early on. And I, I think the other thing that maybe Elizabeth didn't touch on, or maybe I might have missed it right at the start, I was on the call, um, was you have to distinguish as well, like there is low energy availability and there is negative energy balance, which ultimately we we you are required to go into a negative energy balance in order to lose weight. Okay. And I think this is always the confusing thing around low energy availability and energy balance. And when people are trying to lose body fat or lose body weight, because you're like, well, I have to go into an energy balance, a negative energy balance in order to do that. But then how do I avoid low energy availability and all these negative signs? So that negative energy balance doesn't have to be so large that it pushes you into a huge caloric deficit or a huge hole that relative to your fat-free mass potentially puts you at risk of low energy availability. And as Elizabeth said, low energy availability or energy availability is related to all the physiological functions of the body outside of exercise, whereas energy balance is related to all the factors that contribute to energy expenditure. So think of thermic effect of food, exercise, expenditure, um, non-exercise activity or activity thermogenesis, things like fidgeting and stuff like that. And like, you've got to, you've got to take that into account without pushing you so far down the line. So something as little as, you know, a hundred, 200 calories consistently over a course of time is going to result in a shift in body fat or body weight without potentially pushing you into this negative physiological effect. Now, again, being in a caloric deficit for a long period of time, and certainly a large caloric deficit, even for as short as, say, six to 10 days, could have negative consequences. So it is really a balancing act about being in that, if you are trying to lose body fat or body weight, a balancing act in terms of monitoring, as Elizabeth said as well, those well-being questions can be such a simple tool to ensure that yes, you are trending in the direction you want. That might be, i.e. jumping on a scale Monday, Wednesday, Friday, monitoring your weight. Your weight loss is not so big that you're getting these negative subjective consequences, i.e. moods not dropping, energy still good, sleep still great, and but you are seeing that shift. Now, as Elizabeth said, if you are seeing those numbers trending from fours or threes consistently down to twos or ones, then you need to reach out to us, okay? Like whether you're on the pilot, the autopilot, co-pilot or one-to-one, -one, we don't care. Like reach out to us and just let us know what's happening. And I've had this recently, a couple of athletes who have experienced some lower energy just subjectively. And when we look at their program, probably calorically, they're probably not taking it enough. And this is always the, the issue with any of this is that yes, we use calculations and yes, we use equations to try and best guess what is required for you. But every athlete is a differing athlete. And what you produce at zone two could be very different to what another athlete produces at zone two. And we're seeing this certainly with a difference in caliber of athlete. So we might have someone like Sky or Holly or Rachel, their zone two output might be very different to an age group athlete zone two, where their normalized power, the pro athletes, their normalized power might be 200 watts in that zone two. Whereas someone who's maybe not as experienced or not as fit or athletically um, in the same sort of position, may be producing a zone two normalized power of 120 watts. That's a very different caloric output. So if you are one of those athletes who does produce a lot of power, potentially, and doing that, then and you're noticing that you are having a few issues, what I would encourage you, and certainly Elizabeth would as well, is reach out to us. Like, 
we're not trying <laughs> we're certainly not trying to like cause any issues or anything like that but it's you know we're doing the best we can based on what we have now we're obviously doing a lot of back end stuff at the moment um in terms of checking formulas trying to improve the outcome or the output of the system in order to cope with every type of athlete and so what i would also encourage every athlete and anyone listening to this if you are on the fuel and program please add coach at fuelin.com as a coach if you are on training peaks today's plan final surge or whatnot because and if you're open to your data being looked at in a little bit more detail we can look at your data and sort of include you in this sort of back-end project um, especially if you're one of those athletes who feels like maybe they're not getting enough calories um, or potentially too sense. too much or, or too many yeah i guess it's yeah the both, other thing both is, ends of the spectrum and I think that's always that. Sorry, just while I'm on this, it's always the tricky thing talking about low energy availability and energy balance because we also have to acknowledge there are athletes on the other side of the spectrum, those who take in too many calories and they struggle with weight loss, um, fat loss, and things like that, and they're unsure why. And again, it's that energy balance equation. So, yeah, to Elizabeth's point, like if you're struggling either with, you know, not losing enough weight or losing enough then uh losing enough body fat and you don't understand why then it can be um that we're providing too much energy to you versus obviously the very serious consequences of low energy availability in red ops thank you so um, uh sorry one quote adam you don't all get trucker caps <laughs> although we are looking at uh you know maybe a little bit of merch somewhere along the line so we should we should everybody loves a good trucker um i can answer ed's question actually oh good because i hadn't heard anything about so, ed i reached out to ann's uh nutritionist dietitian unfortunately <laughs> the response i got back was um not forthcoming in terms of sharing any information um i only wanted the principles i didn't want the exact information but you know some people are a bit precious about what they think they contribute to the world of sport um so i talked to alan about this we had a chat like you know obviously i heard that as well in her post-conference thing and i was like oh that's really interesting and then we were chatting about it i don't know if you've ever consumed eaas or bcaas um they're not the nicest tasting thing um consuming vast quantities of that um during a race i think would be very difficult um theoretically i guess you could use some protein or some you know uh form of eas bc AA's, or even a denatured whey like a clear whey maybe as an energy substitute i i don't quite understand how they would do it in vast amounts um to substitute so i don't know if it's like I don't know how well informed Anne is. My understanding is she's very, very intelligent and, you know, has a good understanding, but I don't know if it was lost in translation, um, what was being referred to there. I, I'm certainly very interested in it. Um, I've had chats with some other athletes about it and they're like, can we use protein instead of, say, carbohydrates? I mean, there's differing oxidation rates though. So, you know, carbohydrates are going to be before protein and protein before fat. Um, but yeah, maybe there's something to it that we're all unaware of at this point in time. Um, it the studies that have been done on using protein is when, say, carbohydrates are in limited availability. So, if you can take in amounts of carbohydrates and without issues, then it's sort of like, well, do you need to take in the proteins? But maybe for those athletes who struggle with carbohydrates for a disease for a you know an actual reason from such as some sort of disease as she described um COVID diabetes then potentially it could be something to look at i hope that helps yeah. we're, we're all none the wiser at this point in time yes <laughs> and all that i had heard about COVID diabetes as they're calling it was very much not in an athletic population and it was very much temporary while the athlete was still suffering from 
the effects of the COVID infection. So I don't like the long-term effects of that. And then, I don't know, it, it's, it, it's an interesting philosophy as to how she might have been affected. I just don't know the mechanism. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, I think if you can take in adequate amounts of carbohydrates, then it's not really something that yeah. needs to be considered at this point in time. Obviously, more research might come out, but the existing research would show that it's not required um, if you have abundant amounts of fuel, uh, i.e. carbohydrates and or fat. Um, what was the thing? I was just about to say something. Uh, oh, I know what I was going to say. So obviously we talk about LEA, like low energy availability and red S, and everyone's like, oh, yeah, a lot of people aren't affected by this as well. I guess, yes, there is, a there is you know, stats of up to, what do we say, up to 40% or whatever of endurance athletes to get it, which obviously leaves potentially 60% of people who don't have it, which I think is really important to talk about as well. And, I know we're going to do some stuff either this week or next week, and it involves Sky Sky Maunch, who obviously everyone saw. Um, she just became the fastest American of all time in Ironman, which is really cool. Um, and talking to Sky, and we've been working together for probably the last five months, what's really interesting talking to Sky about her approach to fueling is that she never wants to have this occur to her. So she never wants to experience any issues with the reproductive system. She doesn't want bone stress injuries. So her focus, rather than going like viewing it as a negative, it's like view it as a positive and view that you never want to go down this route. So therefore fueling is super important to her. And despite what might've been said to her in the past by coaches, a coach and whatnot about her maybe being too heavy, to compete at the highest level. She was like, stuff you, I'm changing my direction. She obviously then got a new coach. She reached out to us um, and really went about ensuring that her training and her racing was fueled appropriately. So she never came into any of the stuff or any of the signs or symptoms what Elizabeth described today. And I think the coolest thing about what, sky is describing now is like she uses the words like happy like fueling correctly and fu using fuel in makes her happy and in making herself happy it makes her husband happy it makes a family happy it makes a coach happy and that's such a cool spin to put on like low energy availability and red s is like let's let's just not even go there like fuel your body appropriately. Like you, so many people get into the sport of triathlon or endurance sports to get healthy. And then they go and under fuel themselves to the point where they're starving yourself to cause all those physiological issues. And when you think about that, you're like, what am I doing? Like, why am I starving myself in a sport that I got into in the first place to get myself healthy? Like, there are there's only ever going to be one winner in every race okay well i guess if, if you look at every age group then there's going to be multiple winners but at the end of the day there's going to be one main winner and like so we're not all going to win i'm not having a defeatist attitude here but think about what you're trying to win when you are racing and when you are training like do you really want to impact your health so badly in the long term because you thought it was good to be at a certain weight which is probably a weight that's way too low anyway for what you're capable of and i think you've, you've just got to step back from the sport a little bit and say why am i doing this i'm doing this to be healthy therefore you need lean muscle mass therefore you do need optimal energy intake Yes, you can improve body composition. And if you are obese, if you are overweight, which is based on, you know, set criteria, then yes, there is obviously a need to improve that based on disease processes related to that. But if you are of a 
you know, adequate weight, adequate body composition, and that is potentially quantified by DEXA or just getting a bit of string, measuring your height, folding the bit of string in half, putting it around your waist. If that bit of string touches, you're probably okay. You don't need to go and lose like a ton of body fat in order to race better. Focus on fueling better. Potentially your training output actually improves and then things start moving in the right direction. You start enjoying your training. You get up to train more consistently. You start hitting all your training sessions, your power output, your running speed, everything starts improving. And in the end, you actually make way more progress than what you would if you were just, you know, skimping on eating that pre-session, you know, piece of toast or having the eggs and whatnot after your session. So I don't know. It, it's it's just something that I battle with a lot. Like I don't under, and again, I know there's so much, and Elizabeth could talk about this, like there is such a mental component to this and what you're, what you're trying to achieve and it's all personal. However, I think it's always to step back to why you maybe got into the sport in the first place. And I think if you come back to that why all the time, then maybe it, it will give you a different perspective on, you know, how to feel correctly. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and it, a lot of times it happens little by little. It's not like athletes are going out and thinking like, you know, yep, I'm going to drastically under fuel for the next nine months. I'm going to, you know, suffer all these consequences. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a decision they make one day after, after one brick session. And then it's, Two days from then, it's something else. And then next thing they know, it's been a month and they're like, oh, you know, I've been doing, you know, I haven't been eating properly. And so it, it never comes on quickly. And so that's why we're always trying to tell you to be mindful on a daily basis. Like, look at, look at the day, you know, just like you don't, you know, try to take in your entire year's worth of training on one day look at fueling each day as intended, as we prescribe, go through that, take it as it is. If it seems I I've had athletes say, Oh, it's overwhelming. And it's like, no, take it meal by meal. Then how are you going to, you know, check that one box, then check the next box, then check the day and then move to the next day, make those tiny little decisions repeatedly consistently. And that's how you avoid Catch, or even catch yourself um, quickly and then kind of like get back on track too. Yeah. yeah, it's all it's all mindset. I mean, all this stuff. And I think as Elizabeth alluded to there, like it, it can be very gradual and can creep up onto you. And you can get caught up in that, I need to be lighter, I need to be thinner. And, you know, even personal experience, like, getting into endurance sports this year, you can see how it can creep in very easily. But it's like, yeah, and I'll, I'll speak from personal experience. Like I'm a heavier athlete and I had this thing of like, I need to be 78, 79 kilos. And I was chasing 78, 79 kilos all the time. And it just was like, oh my God, this is just too hard. My training sucks now. And then it was like, okay, well, I'm just going to stay at 80, 81 kilos much better suddenly i was like oh i get to eat a heap because like my current weight is my goal weight and suddenly fueling gives me a heap of food and i feel heaps better i can train and i actually feel better and yes i'm two kilos heavier than what my i thought i should be but the reality is is like one or two kilos it's not going to make that big difference honestly you're better off being fueled being comfortable with where you're at and just smash your training and smash food and just feel really good about yourself. And I think it's, yes, it, it it's going to depend on your character and it's going to depend on who you are. But if you're having those types of issues and you're sort of wondering, about, like talk to someone, talk to a coach, whether it be one of the coaches of fueling, talk to your athletes and fellow athletes, talk to your actual training coach about what might be best for you. And obviously, if that person or people that you're talking to are sort of like, no, no, keep losing weight, obviously change friends and, you know, change coaches and things like that. But like just, again, 
just take a step back from it all and just think, why are you doing this? And, and you'll you'll probably have a much better outcome. Um, very good, Elizabeth. It's um, it's always an interesting topic. Um, oh, the, I know what I was going to say. The other thing I would say is if you are trying to lose improved body composition or lose body fat and you are on the fuel in program and I will emphasize this and we emphasize this all the time. Don't try and have a huge drop from your current body weight to your goal body weight. Put it at something realistic. It might be four or five pounds. It might be two or three kilos. Small chunks, get to that. Then we will change the amount of calories you get because it's like a refeed. You'll be put on a maintenance program. Calories will go up. You can then have at least that week or a couple of weeks just enjoying being back where you are and then trying to achieve, again, small chunks along the way. And this is a much more manageable and achievable way of sustainable, you know, improvements in body composition not necessarily weight loss but improvements in body composition and i think again don't try and lose you know, 20 kilos 20 pounds whatever it is you're, you're trying to do just do it in small chunks make sure it's manageable make sure it's consistent make sure that you know you're not suffering from anything that elizabeth is talking about today and that's really really important we do not want any athletes suffering from you know low energy availability or certainly red S in the you know the scheme of things. Awesome. All right. Ed that I haven't heard of that movie, Ed, so that looks it's called Bleed for This. Ed put in the chat. Uh yeah. <laughs> Amazing yeah. when you're not starving, <laughs> how much yeah. better you can perform. Uh, thanks for that, Ed. What's yeah. it called again? Uh, bleed for this. Bleed for this. Yeah. Is it on Netflix or Netflix? Yeah. Cool. Cool. I need it. I need a good one for the week. So thanks, Ed. Um. Okay. So that's about it, I think. Um. I know. Obviously, at the end of this session, please leave some feedback for Elizabeth um and the session and obviously things you want i know alan's going to be doing a talk next week which is about a, uh like assumptions and energy balance and equations and all the things that are encompassed and uh encompass sort of those calculations now it might sound like a heavy session but i think it's actually really important for athletes to understand how these calculations occur and also what we're looking at in the back end of fuel in and how we're looking to improve those calculations over time. So I think it will be a really interesting session. I'm certainly interested in it because I think the whole mathematical modeling around uh, energy intake and energy expenditure and that is, is fascinating. Um, so please join us for that one. Uh, I'm sure Alan will have a lot of good insights into it and we'll, we'll have some uh, good questions, but yeah, I think, Elizabeth, thank you for touching on this. And I know it's a very personal topic for you as well. Um, you know, and you've been very open about that. And I think that's, it's amazing. And I think that's helping more and more athletes be open about it. I think someone like Rachel Zelinkas has been extremely open and, you know, she's performing at the highest level now. And I think, you know, talking to her, she's been really very open about talking about this. And I think a lot of what you've done with talking about your experiences has helped a lot of athletes, both female and male, be a little bit more open. So I, I thank you for that. And uh, I know it's not always easy. Thank you. Yeah, no, it's uh, just here. Like it's always, uh, if anything, it makes me so grateful to not be where I used to be that I almost like, oh yeah, okay, life used to be, life used to be pretty different. And <laughs> looking, if someone had told me back then, all of the long-term health consequences, you know, for a while it was like, oh yeah, so you don't get your period, no big deal, that's really convenient. If I had known that I was like putting myself at risk for Alzheimer's and heart disease and whatnot, I, it might've had a different, <laughs> it had a different impact. So 
hopefully people start, uh, you know, making change and spreading the word too, not just to this group that's on this call, to the people in your tri club, to, you know, if you have uh, kids that are in high school sports and athletics, collegiate sports, like the sooner we address these issues and kind of spread the word, the better. So don't, don't keep it to yourself, spread it all over. <laughs> uh, very good. All right, guys. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Nice to see some different faces as well in the calls. <laughs> and uh, we will chat soon. We'll see you guys next week. Tune in. Thanks, guys. Bye -bye. Appreciate it. See ya.